Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's such a uh, great opportunity to come tonight to Yoga Works, which is where I take yoga classes. And my beloved yoga teacher is here, so I'm sure she'll have lots of things to tell me after watching me move about, which is really the only reason I'm doing it. It's to, um, but it's great. It's really uh, fun to be able to perform in my hood. You know, it's, it's not a common uh, opportunity these days. And it's great to see so many friends and students and people I know out there and new people as well. So, welcome. I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to do for those of you who aren't familiar with this form. So I practice a form of theater called motion theater, which is a form I created over many, many years of decade, decades now, um, <laughs> researching performative forms. I started out as a dancer, and I started using language, and I worked with scripted material, which I still do. But this form is improvised and autobiographical. And a few years ago, I started working with the framework of the last 24 hours. It's a kind of loose framework. You know, it slides to 25, <laughs> 30, depending on what's happened. And, uh, and I teach this work, so if you're interested in classes, it's, it's very, um, I, you know, I could go on and on about this, but I won't, I'll refrain. But it's really transformative to, you, to actually look at one's life and <coughs> express it with physicality and language. And a lot of people, I make my students do 24 hours as well, and every, you can see the panic in the room. They go, but nothing happened in 24 hours. And then as people just start to say, you know, what, how they brushed their teeth and plugged in their electric toothbrush, and, you know, these amazing stories of the day start to emerge. So it's a way of kind of recovering one's own life at a time when um, so much of our media impoverishes our own lives, right? So we feel like nothing's going on. Um, so I encourage you to come do it. We have our first teacher training happening this year, which I'm really excited about. We have 13 people who are getting certified and are going out into the world and teaching it in hospice environments and Buddhist environments. And um, where else are they teaching? Recovery communities. So it's improvised. I do work with an outline. I think about what I want to say. I don't always do that, but it, when I, if I'm doing an hour-long show, I kind of think beforehand about what the material is and try to put something together that has some coherence. But whether or not I remember to do any of that or how it unfolds is uh, always a surprise. And so thanks for coming. If you have questions um, afterwards, we have a mailing list out there, and there's books and CDs and stuff. And, um, there's classes coming up. My students are all performing next weekend in the city. So if you want more information, go to the website. There's all kinds of very cool stuff happening. And it's, it's really about community and being together and telling each other our stories. So thanks for being here tonight in the yoga studio. I am. Um, yesterday afternoon in the Marin Airport. I've taken a seat on the side of the airport that looks out over the city rather than over the ocean. I hear this is the side people jump off of. I also hear that right after they've jumped, they regret it. Those who've survived, there's that moment of fling, and then, oh, no. I'm not thinking about that, though. <laughs> Although I hear one does start thinking about things like that at this time of, of astronomical situation. I'm thinking about the astronomical situation because I'm just coming home from being in Germany and being in New York and I'm on my way home and I do that thing that I hate that people do in the airport, which is I pull out my cell phone 
and I hook in the earplugs, no, the earphones, with the little microphone, the white ones, because it's an iPhone, and you have the little microphone, and then you lose it, and you go to the store, and you say, I lost it, I lost it, and they give you a new one so that you'll come back and buy more expensive things. They say, here, it's free. <laughs> I call my friend, Jennifer, and we start making plans for this Sunday eclipse. She gets online, and I get online, and we're both online on our implements. On our, I'm online on the Marin Airporter, and I'm talking on the phone, and I'm thinking about all the people overhearing my conversation. But I don't care, because I'm not talking about our personal relationship and the stress. We're talking about the eclipse. I think it's important people overhear this conversation. <laughs> Where are we going to go see the eclipse? I suggest Chabot. She looks up Chabot on her computer at home, or maybe she's using her iPad, or maybe she's got them both going at the same time and the phone. Chabot is sold out, she tells me. The entire eclipse at Chabot, which is way up the hill, and they have huge telescopes, is completely sold out. And so we look some more. Well, where else can we? We can go to the Marina Green, except we need eclipse viewing glasses. Solar eclipse viewing glasses. In the old days, you used to be able to make them out of black and white film that you just held in front of your eyes. But now, due to further research on protective eye situations, you, have to, you, you can burn the retina. If you look, you can burn the retina and be blinded for the rest of your life just by looking. And then you're going to want to look. You're going to want to take off the glasses and just look. <laughs> so. We continue to look online, me and the thing, and her and the thing, and we're looking for solar eclipse viewing glasses. She calls the California Academy of Sciences, and they are completely sold out. There is not one single solar eclipse viewing plastic, cheap, 89-cent cardboard film glass left in the entire universe. <laughs> I find myself <laughs> trying to remember. I haven't slept much. I woke up very early to get the car in New York, to get to JFK, to wait in line, to go through security, to be frisked by people with plastic gloves on. I touched for a while, so I actually wanted her to take a little bit longer rubbing her hands <laughs> up and down my body. And then I had to wait for the airport, and I'm on the airport, and I'm looking at the bay, and the boats are all out. It's a sunny day, and the boats are all flitting about the bay. And I'm thinking, where did I put the eclipse viewing glasses that I had when I went to Hawaii? What was it, 20 years ago? <laughs> I have some eclipse viewing glasses <laughs> somewhere, but where? And in my mind, I'm running through all of the closets of my house. I'm scanning the boxes of shoes that need to be sorted through and given to the goodwill, except the goodwill is I'm not sure I should give it to the Goodwill. Maybe I should give it to the Marin Humane Society Boutique or the Dress for Success or, or, or in the filing cabinet. Maybe I filed them under adventures in the past in the personal file in the closet. Or maybe there's like a Burning Man box in the basement. Or I'm not scanning in my mind. Where are the solar eclipse of viewing glasses? Where are the solar eclipse viewing glasses? I have some somewhere I could sell them for thousands of dollars. <laughs> In Hawaii, we went to, what's it called? The bird of paradise, the, hula, the children of the 
Paradise Lost, the <laughs> children of refuge, refuge, the, re the children, the refuge, the black lava sand refuge. There we parked ourselves. My friends were taking little bits of this and that. <laughs> and we lay out with our solar eclipse viewing glasses on our faces. And we had blankets and little bits of this and that and snacks and bottles of this and that. And it was 20 years ago and one did this and that quite a bit in the day. <laughs> and then you lie there. And there are other people lying there. And you are lying on your back, looking up at the sky. And the sun is there, really bright. And you're protected. Your retinas are not going to be burned. You've been reading stories about people who have been blinded for life due to direct looking, because you can't help. They couldn't. They just ripped them. They look. They want to look. It's like, no, no. But no, you've got them on. <laughs> and suddenly, Due to the relationship of moon and sun. Oh, and don't forget, because you've studied. This is before the internet, and you had to go to the library. <laughs> that in Native American tradition, at least some Native American, these are not, this is a dangerous, you have to put red cords around your waist, red belts. We are there wrapped in our red protective belts. Because during an eclipse, really negative forces can be affecting your entire life, can fall apart, and the economy is going to collapse, and the bees are going to die, and the sparrows are going to go crash into the different things, and the, the fish, and you won't have anything to eat, and the entire thing is going to just go down, down, down. But it's an opportunity for resurrection. <laughs> and you watch the, the moon move in the path of the sun until the sun in the middle of the day gets slightly occluded and changes its shape in the sky. And you're lying there on your blanket drinking a little bit of champagne thinking, how does this work? I studied it in grade school. They had little models kind of of things rotating and you're sitting there, okay, the earth. The earth is moving about. It does not feel like it's moving about at an angle. The earth is moving about. <laughs> and the moon is moving about the earth that is moving about. And then the sun, the sun is still, is it? <laughs> The sun is still, the earth, and the sun, and then the moon, the earth, and then the moon, the moon, and you're just this little looking at the earth, and the sun, and the moon, and the planets, and the universe, and the Mars, and the Venus, and the Jupiter, and they're all moving about, and you're moving about, and you're this tiny little person, and you, you were just worried about whether or not you should have a cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> And then the weirdest thing is, you put on your bathing suit, because it's Hawaii, and the water is warm and salty and soft. And you dive in when the moon has completely cut off the light of the sun, except for the annular ring, <laughs> the annular eclipse. The annular ring, because the moon is completely in front of the sun, and all there is is a ring of fire all the way around, and you have your red thing on. And you dive in, and the fish have all gone to sleep because it's dark. No one is moving. I'd never seen a sleeping fish before. There it was, just kind of laid out. Its mouth was not going. Fins were not going. He was just sleeping. An entire ocean of still fish because it had gotten dark. And then as the sun started to 
No, the sun does not move. <laughs> the earth moves. It appears that the sun is moving, but the sun is not moving. The earth is moving and the moon is moving. And that gives this sort of weird illusion that the sun actually rises and sets. But the sun does not rise. The sun, the, in the, <laughs> then as the sun started to reappear from behind the moon, the fish started to swim again. And the birds started to sing again. They had the whole, th the, the everybody, it was very strange. And then you collect the time. You collect eclipse time. I have now been about 25 minutes and 30 seconds at a solar eclipse. And there are people all around you saying, well, I've been to five. I have you know, 55 minutes and 29. So, well, I have like 520 minutes because I was at the one in Australia. I was at the one in Beijing in 1925. <laughs> and something in you wants to see it again. You just want to. You want more minutes. As if there's a, like a, craving set up in the system for eclipse time. You never wanted it before, but now you want it, and the glasses are all sold out. And you have this like, craving for eclipse time. So before unpacking the cigarette, I wheel my suitcase into the house, run to the computer, which I have to unpack. It's the only thing I unpack is the computer. I set it up, I plug it in. I have a new chair that's sort of bouncy. I bounce on the chair, it has a spring in it, and I look for eclipse glasses. <laughs> I am now studying, and I find out you don't need eclipse glasses, you can get welder's glasses, number 14. So I Google the welders in Marin County, and I find air gas, and I think, yes, now I'm on the right track. And I call the air gas company, and I say, do you have welder's glasses, number 14? He says he's had 200 calls in the last hour. <laughs> and suddenly my entire life seems like a complete failure. I mean, how could I possibly not have thought of this before? Well, when I was in New York, I could have ordered them from Amazon.com. Just they cost 89 cents. Send them in the mail. You get five of them for your friends. And what's wrong with me? I'm so, as you say, I'm so what kind of person. And like, big things are happening in the world. And all I care about is not even see about the eclipse. The eclipse is happening. And I don't even want my glasses. What's wrong with me? There's something seriously wrong with my life. <laughs> At which point, my friend Dahlia knocks on the door. She's come to take me to San Francisco to move the queen bee from one hive to another. Normally, I wouldn't have taken on the adventure after having just flown in from New York. <laughs> but given that I was performing the next day, I figured I needed some material. <laughs> So off we set. It's very hot in here. Off we set. We go to San Francisco in her car. She's driving her son's car, which is a stick shift, and she seems slightly unfamiliar with stick shifts. And we're, we're, we're like racing to the city in this kind of like that, going across the. And as we go, she's explaining to me things about bees, which I know very little about. She said, but she's talking very, very quickly, and the car's kind of jerking about. And I haven't slept very much because I've just flown in from New York and it's like hours ahead. And she's telling me that we have to put the bee in a cage, the queen bee, and move the bee from the cage to the other cage. And the, the way the nectar and the flying about and the proboscis honey of the... <laughs> and I'm nodding. We get to San Francisco where Dahlia has the bees on the roof of a very grand house in Pacific Heights. And we walk in with her bags, up one flight of stairs, 
ha, up another flight of stairs, ha, we stop to look at the portraits on the wall that are in kind of French gold frames. We keep walking up the stairs, up the stairs, down a like secret hallway. It's very dark and I'm carrying like strange bee equipment. We walk up this steep little narrow dark hallway onto the roof. The view is quite lovely. It's a kind of pebbly, what's it called, gravel roof, flat, and you can look out over the entire city. And they have these strange things at the top that go like this, like singing nuns. I think they're air vents. <laughs> and it's very, very windy. So I put on lots of layers of clothing because I want to the hood and the fleece, and then Dahlia starts bringing out the, the bee equipment, the bee gear, the bee outfits, which are just like you've seen in movies. First, you slip on a white suit that zips up, and then you put on the things that go over the legs and the feet so that the bees don't slip into your <laughs> pants and sort of sting you from underneath your clothing. Those go on each leg. And then there are long gloves that go all the way up and are very, very clumsy, at which point you have to put on the hood with the netting all around it, only you can't because your hands are in the gloves. And so you have to take the gloves off and put on the, the little helmet. And the helmet has a big, big netting all around it. And then you have to zip the netting to the outfit, which if you forget to do, then in your outfit and your gloves and your booties, the bees come into your outfit and you cannot get them out. And so you, you zip the thing up and you look like you're about to go to outer space. <laughs> At which point you are all suited and netted and you want to take a picture. <laughs> with your iPhone. <laughs> which you forego. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dahlia is putting strange bits of sawdust and netting into the little smoker that has a little smoking arrangement to it. And she's explaining that we're going to go smoke the bees she offers me the opportunity to operate it myself. And so with the gloves, I pick up the little tiny, tiny, you pick up the tiny, I try to pick up the falls and the wind is blowing and blowing and blowing and the three tiny hives on top of the roofs and the singing nuns are going back, back and forth. And I'm acting very calm. I have not told Dahlia that I think I'm deathly allergic to bee stings <laughs> because I needed material. So, okay, we're, one of the, you might not be, I found it very, it, it, it's incredibly interesting, actually. No, okay, there are three hives, and one of the hives does not have a queen bee, and so Dahlia tells me the bees are very unhappy, and she can tell by the way they sound. She's very sensitive to the sound of the hive. And the other hive is just going. <laughs> so there are two hives with the queen, and there's one hive without a queen. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the queen from the one hive and put it in the hive that doesn't have the queen. And we do that by taking this little metal mesh frame. It's called a cage, but it's just a little tiny piece of mesh metal. And you, you have to find the queen. So you're wearing all of this stuff. You can hardly see through the mesh. And the queen looks almost like every other bee. So the first assignment is to find the queen. So you have to lift out these little trays that are full of honeycomb and search it. And the bees make a star pattern around the queen. So you're looking at these. They are deathly allergic to looking for the star pattern. We find the queen and we smash the little cage into the 
honeycomb. And the, the cage just has a few sides to it like that. And so you can like smush it into the honeycomb. And honeycomb, it, it kind of clings to the honeycomb. And the bees inside it with all the other bees. And the queen is in there. And then I had the privilege of brushing all the other bees off of the honeycomb. You have a sort of stiff little soft brush. It's kind of soft and kind of stiff at the same time. And you, you brush it along the comb, and the bees just tumble off and tumble off. Massive amounts of bees are tumbling through the air, and you're trying not to kill them. You go, Amani Padme Huma, Amani Padme Huma, Amani Padme Huma, Amani Padme Huma. The bees are falling off into the thing until finally, they're gone, and you can take that little frame and put it into the hive that doesn't have a queen, and then you bring that frame back into this, and so the hive without a queen doesn't have a queen, but it has little eggs in it, because the hive with the queen made eggs. And so you take the eggs and put it in the hive. It's, it's, you, you, it's gonna work. <laughs> so the hive that didn't have a queen was going <laughs> now is a queen, and the hive that did have a queen, doesn't have a queen. <laughs> Dahlia explains to me through her mesh outfit that what happens is the queen has laid eggs and the other bees immediately all know all at the same time, that they have no queen in their hive anymore. And so they start feeding five eggs royal jelly. And the royal jelly transforms the egg into a queen bee. The first queen bee out makes sure that she kills the other queen bees as they emerge from their little hive. Because there can only be one queen bee, which I understand. <laughs> Then the queen bee flies. She takes this very dangerous flight away from her hive through the skies of Pacific Heights. And she lands where the drones have collected, sort of smelling her coming. And all of the drones begin to penetrate her with their endophallus. And they all die. But they leave their endophallus inside of her. The entire purpose of the drone is to insert their semen into the queen bee and then to die. And she flies home with all of the phalluses in her body. <laughs> Brie enters her hive and lays eggs the weight of her body for the rest of her entire life without ever having to meet another drone again. <laughs> Everyone has a job in the hive. I'll tell you more about that a little later. But then she told me one time Dahlia came to her hive and she heard the buzzing and she could tell that from the sound, that it, the humming and the buzzing, that the bees were sad. Now, how could you tell that the bees were sad? I, I'm not, I came, I, my father was a scientist, and you know, sad bees, and a little anthropomorphized thing. What do you mean, sad? Why would it be sad? <laughs> she said it was, it was this kind of, you know, instead of a because their queen had died and they were all mourning when I got home I got back on the computer I was determined to figure out a way to get solar eclipse viewing glasses because I remember when I was a kid, you just took film and you held it in front of our eyes. So I go to the sites, you, know, you, you Google, you try to get the right words in there so that it will deliver the thing that you want. It's kind of like 
if, if you can just articulate it right, the computer will deliver the thing that you want. If you just have the right words and the right combination. So you put like homemade solar eclipse viewing glasses film, like I used to do when I was a child, <laughs> and living in Los Altos. And my father was a photographer, and so we just took film, and we could go outside and make it ourselves. There is a way to do this. I know there is. Please help me. <laughs> And then it comes back up. Do not use film. <laughs> you will burn your retina. <laughs> My life is a failure. <laughs> I mean, solar eclipses only happen every once in a while, and there's a really big one happening. You don't even have to travel anywhere. You don't have to go to South America. You don't have to go to China. It's happening right in your own neighborhood, and you do not have solar eclipses. You think, like, oh, what's wrong with you? There's something seriously wrong with you. I mean, what kind of a person are you? You're not young anymore. You could have figured this out. You could have ordered things in advance. They have it everywhere in the entire world. And you forgot to order your eclipse viewing glasses. What is wrong with you? you? You're gonna have to make a little pinhole thing and just look at the shadow of the eclipse. Isn't that like your entire life? Just looking at shadows of things <laughs> instead of like having the real experience. It has to be like mediated. It has to be sort of half-assed. It has to be, you'll just be there by yourself in a little corner. Thousands of people will actually be seeing the real thing and having the real experience. And you'll just be accumulating time by looking a little shadow of it that you make from a little box that you don't even really know how to make, do you? And you don't want to read the instructions on the thing about how to make the little shadow viewing box. You do not want to look at a little shadow viewing box. You don't want to look at the reflection of the eclipse. You want to look at the eclipse. It's not a platonic situation. You already know you're in a cave looking at a shadow on a wall. That's the nature of life itself. You studied philosophy. You just want the fucking real thing unmediated, but you do not want to go blind for the rest of your life. You just want solar eclipse viewing glasses. <laughs> I wake up early, I meet Jennifer with her, you know, almost three-year-old sort of godchild, sort of nephew, sort of hard to explain relationship with the child. You're helping a friend who's single, who was inseminated and had a kid, and so then you step in and you become something or other. <laughs> And up we drove, following one of those maps on the iPhone. There was like a completely direct route that it didn't manage to find. And so there we were, driving up the hill in Berkeley, turn left, and in two seconds turn right again, and then turn left again. And it was like a pilgrimage where you have to go completely out of your way to get to the thing that you really want. You may not even get there, but you have to suffer a long way, suffer, suffer. So by the time you do get there, you will have a true epiphany of hard work, having earned you the getting to Lawrence. Hall of Science. I run in. It's early in the morning. No one is there yet. And like the only person in the entire Lawrence Hall of Science, I run up to the front desk. No, first I run into the little store. The, the, I say, do you have solar eclipse viewing glasses? They say no. No. We have 500 we're giving away tomorrow if you're one of the first 500. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> we'll also have solar viewing telescopes if you can make your way through the crowd. You know, if you can find a place to park. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about, like in India, how you can just... <laughs> I said, I just couldn't help myself. I mean, I've thrown on my clothes. I'm wearing the things that I wore in New York. I haven't packed. I'm smelling, probably, because nothing. So I'm just, in a, just like on a mission. I want my shoulder clean to be wearing glasses. And I look at her, and my hair is like this, and my lipstick's on wrong. My mascara is dripping down my cheeks. And I, just, I try to be, be an adult and look like I have some credibility, like I deserve one of the solar eclipse viewing glasses. I think about telling her I'm teaching disabled blind children, <laughs> taking them on a special, a special tour to the top of, and, and I realize if I'm blind, they don't need the glasses, so I need to get my story straight. <laughs> and I say, have you thought about the parking? 
what time do I need to get here? So I camp out in the lot. <laughs> Luckily, we have a three-year-old with us, and so we go downstairs into the, you know, the, it's the Lawrence Hall of Science, and so they have things for children to do, which is a good thing, because we have to entertain the child. And so we, we take him about, and you put a ball in a little thing, and it goes vroom, like that. And so I put a ball, and he puts a ball, and we're going to have a race, and I'm going to win. <laughs> and the ball goes vroom, vroom. You don't really care why, although you feel obligated to read the thing. Because you, you want to learn something. And the two balls go. And then there's this little play area full of, of soft building blocks that are made out of pillows. And so I sit down, and Jennifer sits down, and we let the child jump around. And suddenly, the entire Lawrence Hall of Sciences is like filled with swarming children. They're just suddenly all there. And there are these children of different heights, different sizes, different languages, different orientations, different colors, different eyes, different little body types. And they're all jumping around in the blocks and kind of instantly creating an entire social game together. Like instantly they know the rules. They know the rules by like looking at each other, even though no one has done it yet, and kind of inventing together. And even though they're littler ones and bigger ones, they're, they're throwing themselves at the pillows and just avoiding completely giving the tiny one a concussion. They, they're like moving in between and, and picking up a big pillow, the tallest one, and like bringing it down on the head of a little one, but just softly enough so the kid doesn't crumble in his thing. They seem to have this like instant agreement about like aggression and protection all, all happening at the same time. And I'm watching and Jennifer's watching and we're just sitting on the side with our purses and our thermoses and our wallets and our identity papers and our eyeglasses and our bank cards and watching the children play because we're adults. And Jennifer looks at me and I look at her and and we realize we're adults, but we're artists. <laughs> she goes, let's do it. And we dive in. And just like the little ones, we start hitting each other, bonking each other. Got a little stress in our relationship. We're throwing that wah, just, just hard enough so it doesn't like, completely demolish the other person. Strong enough to know that you fucking up. And the kids are looking at us, and we realize. <laughs> we better play with them, too. So we pick up a pillow, and we see some two-year-old. <laughs> diving into things, scurrying in the swamp. And the other adults are watching us. <laughs> watching them. Then it's time to go. On the way out, I noticed the man behind the desk has solar eclipse viewing glasses. <laughs> like Armani's sunglasses <laughs> perched atop his head. I approach him. My eye on his glasses, wondering if he realizes that he's taunting every visitor who's come that day, because I've heard them all run to the desk and say, are you selling solar eclipse viewing glasses? No, we're not. Ah, we have 500 and you can't have one. Ah. <laughs> and I say, how much? He will not give them up. Think about like inviting him into the children's area. <laughs> Maybe I can like maneuver one of those and then snatch them and race out. When I get home, I get back on the computer, desperate now to figure out a way to the woman at the desk at the Lawrence Hall of Livermore Science, the animation, 
children play, adult observe, fun, house. <laughs> Said, well, you can use the um, tin foil of a cherry pop tart. <laughs> They're probably all sold out, I said. <laughs> I continue at home to type in homemade solar eclipse viewing glasses film. I know I can, and it just all comes back. Oh, this left for you, you little loser. <laughs> you little scumbag. You little ill prepared, can't think ahead, kind of fail of a human being is the shadow option. You build a little, you know, box with a little tiny hole in it. It's called a pinhole camera. And then you just look at the shadow of the thing. It will be very, very small. Everyone else will be having their solar eclipse viewing glasses on. And you will be there by yourself over in the corner. <laughs> just looking at a little tiny shadow of light being very slowly. It takes three entire hours and you will be staring at the ground when everyone else is looking at the heavens. No, 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 no. That's your karma this lifetime. I mean, just accept it. It's due to the causes and conditions arising simultaneously because you probably were a horrible person last live. And so maybe if you just put up with looking at the shadow, next time, you know, you'll come back as someone who knows how to order solar eclipse viewing glasses in advance. I decide to study bees. Bees evidently. have a very complex social structure. They create a hive and they lay the little eggs inside those little cubicles. The little egg sits inside the little cubicle and turns into a larva, at which point the cubicle is sealed up by the other bee and so it can just stay in its little cubicle and turn into a bee. And then it comes out, it eats its way out of its little cubicle. Bees are very, very clean. And its first job is to clean the entire hive. It cleans the entire hive along with everyone else who is cleaning the entire hive until it gets strong enough that it can then feed the young that are being born. And at some point, its final journey, it can fly out into the sunshine. It has been in the dark the entire time. And in the dark, the other bees have come back who are bigger than this bee. They're all female. They, the males just get shoved out. All that's left is female bees cleaning the hive because that's what females do. They clean the fucking hive. <laughs> And then the, the uh, bigger ones, they go out and they figure out where the food is because they can smell it. And, and then they come back, and you've all heard about this, in the dark, they dance to show the other bees where the food is. They, they draw a straight line if it's directly in the direction of the sun. And they know, how to, they know that the sun moves through space. And so the straight line is predicted to be where the sun is exactly at that moment. And, and then they run in a circle in this direction if it's that side of the sun and they run in a circle in this direction if it's this side of the sun is a very very complicated dancing in the dark and then they fling themselves out into the sunshine and they orient themselves in relationship to the sun and they find the nectar and they bring it back honey Dahlia said is like liquid sunshine I get an email while I'm studying about bees. I'm also learning about colony collapse disorder. That's when the entire colony just disappears. And the beekeepers go to look for their bees, and there are no bees. It's completely disappeared. It's a phenomenon. And I'm thinking, yes, that's what's happening to humans, too. We're having colony collapse disorder, only no one's admitting it. So I get an email about swarming starlings. 
which I've brought to read to you because it is so fantastic. I rarely read during an improv. This will be a unique experience for all of us. I saw Eddie Izzard perform. If something didn't work, he would just write on his palm, don't do that again next time. <laughs> this is an experiment. This is so exciting, though. Starling murmuration in Britain. <laughs> this is another fascinating mystery of nature, it says. No one knows why they do it, yet each fall, thousands of starlings dance in the twilight above England and Scotland. The birds gather in shape-shifting flocks called murmurations. Having migrated in the millions from Russia and Scandinavia to escape winter's frigid bite. Scientists aren't sure how they do it. The starlings' murmurations are manifestations of swarm intelligence, which in different contexts is practiced by schools of fish, swarms of bees, and colonies of ants. As far as I'm aware, even complex algorithmic models haven't yet explained the starling's aerobatics, which rely on the tiny bird's quicksilver reaction time of under 100 milliseconds to avoid aerial collisions in the giant flock. Despite their tour de force in the dusky sky, starlings have declined significantly in the UK in recent years, perhaps because of a decline in suitable nesting sites. The birds still roost in several of Britain's rural pastures, however, settling down to sleep and chatter after their evening ballet. So go home and look it up, Murmurations, because you can see the video. And there are these like clouds of starlings, and they're all going through the sky together. And suddenly, and there are millions of them, in one flash of an agreement, they shift direction. And then and they split the cloud up into two, and then they're moving through the sky, and they go invisible for a second. And then the whole cloud of millions of starlings shifts again. And they're all making these huge patterns in the sky in instant agreement, one with the other, one with the other, an instant kind of psychic agreement, moving through the sky, switching places. It's just like a beehive where they all know what's going on at the same time. The queen arrives and they all know the queen is there and they start behaving in unison in the other hive where the bee is missing. They all know instantly that the bee is missing, just like the clouds of starlings moving through the sky. They're moving about and it's like nanosecond of agreement. Foom, foom, foom. It's the most amazing thing to watch. And you wonder, how come we don't do that? Colony collapse disorder. When a bacteria or a fungi gets into the hive, a bee will go out and find the plant that is antibacterial or antifungal to that particular bacteria or fungus. And it creates propolis and it protects the whole hive with a sticky substance that is directly antibacterial or antifungal. It knows which bacteria is responsive to which plant. And it goes out and it finds the flower and it comes back and protects the entire hive from the disease. The night before last, I was sitting with my niece in a small Japanese restaurant on the Lower East Side. She has long, dark, straight hair and big brown eyes, and she's very slim, and she's turning 26. She's going to medical school, and she says at Columbia that when she goes in to take an exam, and she tells her fellow students, oh, that exam was really hard. They all just look at her. She says that it's graded on a curve in the class, and so all anyone wants is for the other person to do badly. <laughs> I wanted to sort of pluck her up and carry her to the other hive. I want to put her in a cage that sticks into the beeswax and put her in the other hive, the hive of everybody working together to solve the problem that emerges, and with a wag of their tail instantly telling information 
to the entire colony of bees and then swarming out in agreement into the, and turning and in a nanosecond all of them together because the colony is definitely in a state of potential collapse. Tomorrow at this time, we'll be coming back from somewhere. The mountain or Lawrence Livermore. I'm hoping to have one of those glasses in my hand. When the eclipse happens, the birds think it's night and they start chirping first and then become silent. And when the sun emerges again, they think it's sunrise and they start chirping again. We'll be standing there with hundreds and thousands of people all looking at the sky. And for a moment, if we're lucky, as the sun is darkened, and the moon sits right in front of it and turns the sun into a ring of fire. Maybe for just a moment, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people with solar eclipse viewing glasses all staring off in the same direction will have this moment of realizing that there is a sun and there is a moon and there is an earth and they are all moving through the big heavens and all the little wondering if I should eat raw food or go on a diet or you know, go to the and the bill and the late and the IRS, it will just all disappear in this vast, vast movement of the heavens. And as the heavens move, there's something moving inside of your body too that's reflecting the movement of the heavens. And you start to place yourself in the big, big, big story. And it is such a relief for a moment just to forget that the bills and the loan and the mortgage and the bank account and why can you never balance your own? Just no, it doesn't matter. The big rotations of the wondrous and the earth is so tiny and so precious and it's about to have colony collapse disorder. You just want to shout out to everybody with their mylar glasses on. Come on, you guys. We can do it. We can all look at how they do it. Just all together now. We can all together. We'll be swarming in a nanosecond together. If we all together in the swarm, we can take just in a, the entire, we know what's going on. Come on, everybody. We can do it. Take this moment. Look at the sun. Do you realize together, if we all together, the whole thing, and we can save the colony. They say it could be pesticides killing the bees. They don't know. They think maybe when the bee goes out and gathers nectar, it picks up a few pesticides too and brings it back. But it's not an instant death. It takes a while. And that's why it's so hard to know whether or not the breast cancer and the testicular and the whether or not, because it's just a little bit, and so you can't really place it anywhere, can you? You just see your friends suddenly running for biopsies and getting diagnosed and then going to a funeral or two and the bees and the starlings are also disappearing even though and you want to say, we can, can't we? Can't we? On the way down the mountain, I'm hoping to have a pair of those glasses in my hand. I'm going to save them for the next time. <laughs> I'm going to put them in a file folder made from recycled paper and write Eclipse Viewing Glasses on the label and then put it in the cabinet under what? recreation, spiritual experience, political activism, necessity, craving, 
collection of minutes. Personal and planetary transformation. <laughs> Adventure. Somewhere I hope I remember where I've put it so I can find it again. Also in the filing cabinet are the letters from my mother and her notes that I saved when she died. She was 53, I was 22. She had a rare kind of cancer, multiple myeloma, that hardly anyone got in those days. But the woman across the street got it as well. And so we wondered, was it the pesticides that they sprayed in huge clouds on the apricot orchards across the street? In the summer, as I rode my bicycle in my bathing suit to the swimming pool at the public, the swimming pool at the public school, you could smell the chemicals in the air as the sunlight poured down on the fuzzy golden apricots that were hanging from the branches. That moment when you're looking at the sun and you're protected. And you see what's really going on. The way the heavens move. What a tiny, miraculous part you are. And then you take your glasses, you go home, you file them in the filing cabinet under hope. Have an extra pair. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I do hope you go out, and that we all go out together and see what's going on and see if we can join together to save the colony. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your attention. Sign the mailing list.